Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number five in the series on the Gospel of John, written by Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. Today's lesson is titled, The Testimony of the Samaritans, and is ready for teaching on November 2. I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the stories of Jesus that we're reading in this amazing book of the Gospel of John. And as we read this week about the relationship with Samaritans and this very special relationship in this story, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide each one of us. We all need your care. We all need your spirit in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you that we can accept Jesus as our Saviour. And as we open your word this week, we pray for your blessing on us who listen, but also on our families, our communities, our churches, and your work as it goes on around the world. But today I'd particularly like to pray for Willie Samari Mamani of Peru and just so many others who listen from Peru in South America and listeners in Romania in Eastern Europe and Daisy in Malawi who listens daily. Lord, each of us need to be able to understand what your word says, but we need to more understand how our salvation comes through our relationship with our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Bless us each one as we learn more about him this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 4 and verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, but we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Let's read that again, John chapter 4 and verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Who were the Samaritans? The northern kingdom of Israel had been taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 BC. To create political stability, the Assyrians dispersed their captives throughout their empire. Likewise, captives from other nations were brought to populate the northern kingdom, and these became the Samaritans, who practiced their own form of Judaism. Relations, however, were not good between them and the Jews. For instance, the Samaritans worked against the rebuilding of the temple at the return of the Jews from Babylon, The Samaritans, meanwhile, had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. But this temple was destroyed by the Jewish ruler John Hyrcanus in 128 BC. At the time of Christ, this animosity continued. The Jews avoided Samaria as much as possible. Though commerce may have gone on, other interaction was taboo. The Jews would not borrow from Samaritans or even receive a favour from them. Within this context, John recounts the encounter between Jesus, the woman at the well, and the people of the Samaritan city of Sychar. Sunday, October 27, the setting of the encounter. Read John chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. What was the background issue that led Jesus through Samaria? John 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. The Pharisees discovered that the disciples of Jesus were baptizing more people than did those of John the Baptist. This situation could create tensions between John's followers and Jesus. 
The disciples of John, quite naturally, were jealous for their master's reputation and status. And we compare this with John chapter 3, verses 26 to 30, beginning at verse 26 of John 3. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John's impressive reply was that he must decrease, but Jesus must increase, as we read in verse 30. Probably to avoid confrontation, Jesus departed Judea to go to Galilee. Samaria provided the most direct route between these two locations, but it was not the only route possible. Devout Jews would take the long way around, going east through Perea. But Jesus had a mission in Samaria. Read John 4, verses 5 through to 9. How did Jesus use this opportunity to open a dialogue with the woman at the well? John 4, beginning at verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jacob's well was located right next to Shechem, while Sychar, where the woman was from, was about a mile or 1.5 kilometres away. Jesus sat by the well while his disciples went into the city to buy food. He had no access to the cooling water of the well. When the woman came to draw water, he asked her for a drink. In John 3, it was surprising that Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews and a rabbi, would lower himself to come to Jesus. He came by night to avoid discovery. But, in John 4, the woman hides in broad daylight, perhaps avoiding contact with other women who came either at the beginning or end of the day when it was cooler. After all, why did she go such a long way to fetch water? and in the middle of the day when it was hot. Whatever the reason for her being there, meeting Jesus would change her life. What scene unfolds next? A Jewish teacher is compared to a Samaritan woman of poor reputation. What a contrast! And yet, in this exact context, a remarkable encounter unfolds. So to finish the day... What are some of the taboos in your own culture that could hamper your witness to others? How do we learn to transcend them? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Monday, October 28, The Woman at the Well Read John chapter 4, verses 7 to 15. How does Jesus use this encounter to start witnessing to this woman? John 4, beginning at verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. 
Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I won't get thirsty, and have to keep coming here to draw water. We read in the Desire of Ages, page 184, The hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus. But the Saviour was seeking to find the key to this heart, and with the tact born of divine love, he asked, not offered, a favour. The offer of a kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. End of quote. As was the case in his encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus knows what is in the woman's heart. In response to her surprise that a Jew would ask such a favour of a Samaritan, Jesus goes directly to the point. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water, John 4 verse 10. The woman's response in verse 9 was like that of Nicodemus, who asked, how can these things be? In the context of a new birth, she asked, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? In verse 11. In both cases, Jesus was pointing them, one a prominent Jewish teacher, the other a Samaritan woman of dubious character, to the transcendent spiritual truths that each one needed to hear and understand. In each case, Jesus was basically telling them both the same thing. They need a conversion experience. What is the Old Testament background to Jesus' statement about living water? Well, first of all, we look at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And Zechariah 14 and verse 8. And that reads, On that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. Water is necessary for life. Humans cannot exist without water, and so water can be a powerful and appropriate image of eternal life as well. Hence, Jesus says, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. John 4 verse 14 And so to finish today, read John 7 verses 37 and 38. What is Jesus saying to us in these verses and how do we experience what he is promising here? John 7 beginning at verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Tuesday, October 29. Sir, give me this water. Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27 reads, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. How does Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27 reflect the truths Jesus was seeking to give to Nicodemus and to the woman at the well? 
In both cases, Jesus was seeking to reach these people with spiritual truths, even though he used illustrations from the natural world to do so. At first, neither person understood what Jesus meant. How, asked Nicodemus, can a man be born again? That is, how can he return to his mother's womb? Nicodemus clearly was functioning at a mundane and earthly level, even though Jesus clearly was pointing him toward spiritual truth. This woman, too, took Jesus' words about the water in a literal sense when Jesus was clearly talking about something spiritual. The woman's response to Jesus' offer of living water was, "'Give me this water that I may not thirst,' nor come here to draw, in John 4 verse 15. She reasoned that the water Jesus offered would obviate trips to the well, thus reducing the risk of facing others. It is striking that the conversation shifted so quickly from Jesus asking for a drink to the woman's asking him for a drink. Read John chapter 4 verse 16. How did Jesus respond to the woman's request? John 4.16, he told her, Go, call your husband and come back. Abruptly, Jesus changes the topic of discussion, telling the woman to go call her husband and come back. Why the sudden shift in topic? The woman's actions bespoke avoidance. Jesus could read her heart. She must face her situation to find healing. And in The Desire of Ages, page 187, we read, Before this soul could receive the gift he longed to bestow, she must be brought to recognise her sin and her saviour. Wednesday, October 30, The Revelation of Jesus Read John chapter 4, verses 16 to 24. What did Jesus do to show this woman that he knew her deepest secrets? And how did she respond? John 4, beginning at verse 16, he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The light was too blinding to look at directly. While recognising Jesus as a prophet, the woman practices avoidance again. She asked Jesus a question of religious controversy between Jews and Samaritans, the proper place to worship. In response, Jesus pointed out that the Samaritans did not know what they worshipped. Their worship was a synthesis of Judaism and paganism. The Jews worshipped the God who reveals himself, another important admission for a Samaritan. Worship of the true God is not tied to a place. The discussion, therefore, about a place of worship was irrelevant to the conversation. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. The woman accepted the plain truth conveyed by Jesus and was ready for more. Read John 4, verses 25 and 26. How did Jesus reveal his identity to her? John 4, beginning at verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. 
Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. In all four Gospels, this is the only passage before his trial in which Jesus plainly stated to someone that he was the Messiah. And he did it not to some large crowd or important personage, but to an unnamed Samaritan woman, alone, at Jacob's well. He is interested in any lonely soul who feels separated. And so to this woman, who not only was from a foreign culture, but also was not of the highest moral character, Jesus openly revealed who he is. And having revealed to her his knowledge of her darker secrets, he also gave this woman a great reason to believe in him as well. And so to finish today, what should this story tell us about why the gospel needs to break down the barriers that we humans create with each other? Thursday, October 31, The Testimony of the Samaritans Read John chapter 4, verses 27 to 29. What surprising action did the woman take? John 4, beginning at verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Or, Why are you talking with her? Then, Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Jesus' discussion with the woman was interrupted by the arrival of the disciples. Though surprised that he was speaking with a woman, they did not question him. Instead, they urged him to eat. The woman, meanwhile, left her water pot and rushed into the city to share with others what she had just experienced with Jesus. Read John chapter 4, verses 30 to 42. What happened following this encounter, and what does it teach about how the gospel can be spread? John 4, beginning at verse 30. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, It's still four months until harvest? I tell you, Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labour. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So, when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Saviour of the world. It seems strange that Jesus' narrative about a harvest could interrupt the story of the conversation of so many in the city. But John wants us to see how Jesus understood what was happening. Sharing the plan of salvation with a Samaritan woman was far more important to him than eating. To lead souls to salvation was his purpose, and he used this occasion to teach his disciples the urgency of sharing the gospel with all people, even with those not like them. There are many high points in the Gospel of John. Surely John 4 verses 39 to 42 is among them.
Many of the Samaritans believed because of the woman's testimony. Verse 39 reads, He told me all that I ever did. The Samaritans asked Jesus to stay with them. The result was that many more believed because of the word of Jesus. Then it reads in verse 42, They said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. And so to finish today, what should this story tell us about how powerful the witness of even one person can be? How powerful a witness are you to what Jesus has done in your life? Friday, November 1. Further Thought From the book The Desire of Ages, page 195, we read, As soon as she had found the Saviour, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear the Saviour. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, in class, go over your answers to Sunday's final question. Be brutally honest about it. What are the taboos and prejudices found in your culture that could indeed hamper your own witness to others? Question 2. Why do you think Jesus got such a warm reception among the Samaritans in contrast to the reception among his own people? 3. Put yourself in the place of that Samaritan woman. A total stranger comes and lets her know that he is aware of her deepest secrets. How could anyone, much less a stranger, have known these things? No wonder she was impressed by Jesus. What should this story tell us about how the Lord knows everything about us, even the deepest, darkest secrets, that we would not want anyone to know? And yet, what does the way he treated her say to us about how he wants to deal with us, even when he knows our secrets. What comfort can we draw from this truth? And question four. What themes in the Gospel of John that we have studied thus far are found in Jesus' ministry to the Samaritan woman at the well? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Unsolicited book in the mail by Andrew McChesney. For most of his life, Rob Setke, a retired U.S. Navy officer, had struggled with the Bible and its meaning. Once an agnostic, Rob was seeking God's will, but the Sabbath posed a problem. He fumed when people skipped church and engaged in everyday activities on Sunday. He asked... Why are you playing golf on Sunday? But inside he wondered, where in the Bible did God change the Sabbath? Rob stopped going to church. He was looking for a new church in Fairbanks in the U.S. state of Alaska when an unsolicited book arrived in his post office mailbox. That's an interesting name, he thought, examining the book. I wonder what the great controversy is. Leaving the post office, he passed a stack of great controversy books that other people had discarded on a counter. It had been a mass mailing. At home, Rob became engrossed in the book. He grew excited as he read how humans, not God, had changed the Sabbath day of worship. Wow, he thought, 
Someone is telling the history of the church in a very logical way. Contacting a friend, he said, I found a great history of Christianity. It's called the Great Controversy. Later, the friend called back. You've got to get away, he said. That's the Seventh-day Adventist church. They're a cult. Rob was surprised. He hadn't noticed the name of the book's author, Ellen White, and didn't know that she had co-founded the Adventist church. No, they are not a cult, he said. They just believe in the word of God. After the conversation, Rob wondered if Adventists worshipped in Fairbanks. Looking online, he found a church located only a 10-minute drive away. On Sabbath, he grabbed his Bible and the Great Controversy and went to church. He had been reading the book for less than a month. The first person to greet him at church was a Sabbath school teacher, Helen. She expressed surprise when she learnt that he had come because of the Great Controversy. You just destroyed my complaints, she said. She had been worried that the small size of the book's text made it impossible to read. Yet Rob had already read three-fourths of the book, and he had come to church to learn more. Today, seven years later, Rob is 70 and a church deacon. He still reads the Bible and the writings of Ellen White daily. When I found the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I found a home and I found truth, he said. Join the Adventist World Church in 2024 in the mass promotion and distribution of the Great Controversy. Ask your pastor or visit greatcontroversyproject.com for more details.